everybody, and welcome to this week's Quantum Alignment Show. I'm Karen Curry Parker. Today's topic is a topic that I think is really, really important. What we see in the human design chart is there is a story of the evolution of humanity. The mechanics of the quote unquote shift are contained within the chart. And I try to go through this information with you guys at least once a year because I think it helps us look at what's going on on the planet right now and to really see these shifts in motion, to really interpret sometimes global events in a way that hopefully lessens your fear or your despair or your depression about what the heck is up on the planet right now. I think it gives us deep insights into why the work that we're doing, particularly our own personal growth and evolution, is so important. You are so important, and the work you do is so important. And I know for many of my clients and my students and my listeners, you know, many of you have been on this path of spiritual growth and evolution, some of you for all your adult life, maybe even before, probably, probably before. And you know, sometimes I think it's easy for us to go, why am I like this? Why do I have this directive? Why, why does life feel so weird for me? And I'm hoping that as we go through this material, and for some of you, it might be a review, that you get a little bit of a reminder or a refresher or insights into the idea that you came here for a reason. You are an evolutionary revolutionary. And you're here to be part of an evolution or a revolution in consciousness. And everything you do and the way in which you show up for your life is important. It matters. And I want to really roll through that today and review that in the context of the human design chart. So when we look at the human design chart and we and we go to into some of the more esoteric stories in the human design system. What we see in the story of human design is that we're actually in the middle of what I'll call a, an energetic upgrade. There is an evolution that is happening in our human design, and our human design chart is actually changing. So the energy blueprint for who we are and how we operate is in flux right now and has been in flux since 1782 or before even. And we're really kind of in the final thrust of this evolution. What human design shows us is that in the year 2027, everything is changing, including the chart. The most important thing that, that is changing is the way in which we create. And I'm going to break down for you in this hour what those changes are in the chart, what the potential impact of those changes are, will be, you're going to see already that we're in the midst of some of it. Uh, and we've been experiencing this for a long, long time now. I mean, if you have been alive for, you know, we've been alive anytime within the last hundred years, and I'm betting that's all of you, you've been feeling the impact of this shift in consciousness. Now, I want to just throw this out here because yeah, I think sometimes when we talk about the date, 2027, people get concerned. Like, well, what? Like, we're going to wake up one day and we're going to be totally different. Evolution is gradual. You're already feeling the thrust of this change in the energy system. And as I go through this material, you're going to see we're already doing it. We're creating the momentum that will be cemented ultimately in the change in the nature of how the, our human system works. But we're in the midst of it already. We're setting the stage, laying the foundation for this quantum era and the emergence of our quantum human selves. This isn't your typical evolution. And I'm actually going to say it isn't your typical evolution because, you know, I think science is bearing out more and more that the way in which we taught evolution in the past in the school systems and in our basic understanding of science isn't actually really valid. There are certain aspects of Darwinian evolution, which is that whole chain of being thing you probably did in high school or college. Um, there's a certain element of that that's, that's there. But what we are seeing, especially in the field of quantum biology or quantum evolution, is that maybe evolution itself is a little bit more deliberate and conscious than we thought. And that the Darwinian explanation certainly doesn't explain everything. And it certainly is certainly even if you learned Darwinian evolution in school, you probably didn't learn it correctly. That whole like 
monkey to ape thing wasn't really how it happened. Um, so, uh, so I just want you to kind of put aside for now any ideas or thoughts you have about evolution and this whole idea of survival of the fittest, particularly in the context of humans. So idea of survival in the, of the fittest is bogus. If we look at the nature of the human design chart, it is built into the heart of who we are and the energy that sets the tone and the direction for which we take our lives. It's built into that, that we take a big chunk of our direction in life from compassion. That isn't survival of the fittest. That's sharing what you have with others. That's the true nature of the human story. And I'm going to explain where this lack thing comes in that puts us in a competitive mindset that's not actually really real, especially if we're moving out of material consciousness and quantum consciousness. This evolution is already in us and it's acting through us. And it's not necessarily in response to our outer reality, which is really kind of what Darwinian evolution taught. And ultimately, it may be what ends up separating us from the animal world, but not for the sake of putting us in control of the animal world, but changing the nature of our relationship with the animal kingdom. It's in us and it's waiting to be activated. If you are familiar with the work of Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who is an evolutionary biologist and not the only one by any means, but just the one who's able to write about evolutionary biology in simple words, it's in our morphogenetic field that the template, the subtle body template for the evolution, or some of you may know this as the grid or, you know, the, 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 the vortex of what's next is already in place. It already exists in the quantum field. It's already being created through us, whether consciously or unconsciously. We can really be part of collaborating and co-creating the manifestation of this evolution with consciousness and with awareness. You all play, we all play a role in orchestrating this phase in humanity. And our own consciousness is part of creating a new world. And I'm just throwing, in, out here, I'm throwing in here a quotation from Abraham. Um, because I think this one is a really important quotation that's very relevant. This is from the Abraham Hicks materials. I actually literally don't know where this quotation came from at this point. Um, it's, it's an old slide that I've used before, but it's so so vital here. Abraham says, consciousness does not need physical form, but physical form needs consciousness. Consciousness enjoys physical form because physical form is the leading edge of thought. So consciousness expands through the physical form. It's not one or the other. So our outer reality, this expansion of consciousness that is us, this outer reality is the expansion of consciousness. And, and I really want to put this out there because I actually want to look at you guys when I say this because it's this is the thing that drives me kind of cuckoo. And I'm really wanting to show you that what's going on isn't very complicated, relatively speaking, to how I think sometimes it's presented. We talk a lot about your inner and your outer reality, or we talk about the physical world and the consciousness world. And I want you to understand that your outer reality isn't any less a part of you than your inner reality. You are dancing in the matrix of the appearance of your consciousness and the actions that we take on the physical plane including the mundane stuff like driving your car to pick up your kid from school is a spiritual act and it's a creative act and I think sometimes we lock down this process and this expression of consciousness as this really complicated thing like we got to meditate and we got to plan our 12-step ascension and look at our you know 45 strand DNA activation. And, and I, I think all that stuff is cool and exciting. And if it turns you on and that's the pursuits that you're following and you feel really drawn to follow that information or those kinds of practices, and that gets you into a state of well-being, then by all means, do it. By all means, do it. But magic you are already magic. You're being magic right now. You are the expression of consciousness right now, watching on a computer screen. And this computer screen is something you were part of creating. And wherever you're sitting on is part of what you were creating. This chair behind you, oh, hopefully you're in a chair. I'm in a chair. Maybe you're watching from a standing desk or your phone in a car. Hopefully you're not watching in a car. But this chair is a manifestation of your energy of support. 
Okay. We forget sometimes, and I think we make it really, really complicated, and it's not. Your outer reality is the same thing as your inner reality. It, you're in the matrix already. And this isn't some separate non-spiritual world that we happen to fall to earth into out of the sky from, you know, as heavenly beings. This is a sacred place. And every aspect, every piece of it, every part of it is an expression of consciousness. All right. So the evolution in the human design chart has four stages. In stage one, we see a shift in the nature of how the flow of the energy in the channel 5539 changes. So when we see a shift in this flow, what happens is the 55, the gate 55, becomes the driving energy, the source energy of everything in the chart. So the energy of the chart and everything in the chart is deeply tied to the gate 55. So the way the energy flows in the chart shifts and this 55 energy becomes the driver for the new, for the quote unquote new human, quantum human. Okay. The gate 55 is called the gate of abundance. It is the place where we create by virtue of our connection to faith. It is the place where when you are emotionally, that frequency of emotional energy, when you are emotionally aligned with what else is possible in your reality, when you are emotionally aligned with faith, when you are emotionally aligned with creating bigger than what your mind thinks you can, when you create from your alignment with faith and source and your trust in the universe, then you find new ways to make things happen in the physical plane. Somebody said to me yesterday in one of the conversations I was having with students, you know, if if we have this evolution and the gate 55 becomes this driving energy, does it mean generators won't matter anymore because there won't be any work to do? There still will be work to do. In the third dimensional world, you know, we still have parameters for this world. You know, we are probably not going to be operating apples out of thin air like avatars, although you are an avatar just in the third dimension. We're probably not going to be breaking the rules of the physical world in that way. However, the nature of what we can create and the possibilities beyond which we think are possible expand significantly with this energy. So I want to put this into a really, really concrete context in a minute after I read the bullets on the slide. So this shift in energy means we begin to change the nature of how we create. We begin to be rooted in alchemy, meaning we create from our connection with our realization that spirit is source. It stabilizes emotional energy. And that's huge because emotional energy, the way it works on the planet right now, has the potential to be destructive. It's actually really, really creative, but a lot of us are really using it in a destructive way or an unconscious way. It, is the, it marks the end of binary consciousness. Okay, no more this or that. No more rich, poor, black, white, male, female. And we're seeing this already in our consciousness. We are working more towards harnessing a consciousness of unity. And that consciousness of unity involves an embracing of the human story being exp expressed on a spectrum of potential. And it's not going to be this or that anymore, have and have not. And as I said before, faith becomes the driver for creativity. Now, if you've been listening to me at all over the last year or so or a few years, you'll know why I think this is so vital. But I want to review this because I think, again, sometimes we make it really complicated and it's not. We are shifting beyond material understanding of the world, which means uh, in the material understanding of the world, to make something happen in the world, it has to exist, first of all, between this very narrow realm of limitations. What we believe is possible is generally the, the, the edges of that limitation. A lot of what defines what we believe is possible is our logical understanding of the world. And that logical understanding of the world is in in part and parcel expressed through science and the scientific process, right? Science says, I have an idea. 
let me see if it's true or not. I'm going to create a hypothesis. I'm going to set up an experiment. I'm going to repeat this experiment over and over again enough times to where I can create math, the statistical validation that whatever I found out from my experimentation is either true or not X percentage of the time. And we take that data, that set of data, and we then define that as truth, right? This is what we believe is possible because science has proved it. First of all, I just want to throw this out here. There's a lot of research now, especially based on people's understanding now of how perception creates. There's a lot of new research coming out that shows that about 70% of science experiments especially by the way in the hard sciences like chemistry and biology, because they don't do double blind studies in hard sciences, that about 70% of scientific data is malleable. And it's subject to the perception of the experimenter and that lots of these experiments can actually be duplicated because the scientist conducting the experiments has a different perception, perception than the original scientist changing the outcome of the science. Okay, that's the first piece. So science isn't actually as hard as we think it is. It isn't as hard and fixed as we think it is. Number two, it's the exception that creates mutation, right? It's exceptions that creates mutation. We see that in the nature of how the circuits work in the chart. And if I tell you a story, and I told you guys a story a few years, uh, a few weeks ago, I talked about, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, Barbara Snyder's, I think her name, the mirror, the case of the woman, there was a, a case of a woman who had a, you know, terminal end stage multiple sclerosis who was in a fetal position and dying and had days to live. And a group of her, the, the hometown where she came from got together and prayed for her. And she had a spontaneous recovery from because people sat around her bed and read these prayers to her. She had an incredible spontaneous recovery where she went from being comatose in a fetal state with atrophied muscles and on a respirator to standing up and dancing around the room within an hour. Those mutative experiences, those things that happen outside the predictable realm of what's possible, start stretching the boundaries of the story of what's possible for all of humanity. You can have, hear a story like that, and maybe you have a disease that is life-threatening. You hear a story like that, all of a sudden it changes your range of possibility quite significantly, right? And when we change the range of what's possible for ourselves, we change the boundaries around which we can create. And our creativity and the expansiveness is what, of what's possible goes up a million fold. So science tells us, if we look at the data, right, that we're doomed, right? Science, if you go to CNN, you, you'll see it every day, all the new kinds of statistics that show how doomed we are, right? We're doomed. We're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of water. We're going to run out of, you know, we aren't finite carrying capacity on the planet. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. But if we look at, you know, the possibility that there's a, there's a solution to the situation that hasn't been discovered yet in the hard world, in the physical world, but that it's out there, then the data around being doomed is false. Think about this for a minute. There was a time in the world where if you said, oh, we're going to build a rocket ship and go to the moon, people would have thought you were cray cray, right? I think the more of us who hold the idea that it's possible for us to create a world of sustainable resources and sustainable peace. And the fact that I can say these words means my brain is translating a potential out of the quantum field and putting it into language. The fact that I can articulate this idea and put it out into the world tells us all that this is a possibility. It hasn't been manifested yet, but it's possible. And that when we operate from a place of possibility and faith with this gate 55, which is where we're moving, there are elegant solutions available to the dilemmas facing humanity right now, but we just haven't tapped into them yet. And that it is up to those of us who are aware and conscious as powerful creators to hold a vision of those possibilities as part of anchoring the frequency of that energy in the collective in order for us to begin the process of creating the opening for those right, brilliant people, wherever they may be, to find the physical <clears throat> three-dimensional way to bring that idea into form on the planet. So we're creating that right now. Those of you who are like, oh yeah, let's do that. Let's create a world of sustainable resources and a world of sustainable peace. Let's build a world where everybody gets along and everybody has enough and all the kids get the education they need and everybody's celebrated for the unique role they play in the, in the cosmic plant tapestry of humanity. 
if you have, have that idea within you right now, you're already doing your part to create that. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing that naked under a moon with a bunch of crystals or if you're doing that from your cubicle while you process an Excel spreadsheet. If you have that thought and you hold that energy, you're adding to the evolution of humanity and to the story of what's possible. And you can break the limitations of science or patterns and logic by moving to creating from a place of faith. Oh, I, oh, we talk about the relationship between hunger and faith. I just want to throw this out here because I think this is um, a really powerful thought for you to take home today. Hunger can be a creative energy. And if you think about being hungry or feeling like your abundance has been threatened, it often places us, if we can get past the freak out right, of that, it often places us in a place of pure creativity. If you've ever been in the situation where maybe something has happened in your life and you don't know what the answer is to it, uh, I'll say that for me that happened many, 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 many months in a row, years in a row. When I first got divorced, um, I had sole custody of my four kids. I was responsible for all the money. I wasn't getting any child support. And there were a lot of months where at the end of the month, I had no idea how we were going to make it. And I really learned in those times as challenged and as you know, much I, I struggled with fear and depression and freak out in those days. There, were a, there was a lot of training happening for me there around being creative. Where, and, and it wasn't about me trying to figure out, okay, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? That didn't help at all, ever. But those moments, those elegantly blissful moments when I literally would drop to my knees going, I have no idea what to do. I literally don't have a single idea. Help me please, source. Those moments became my most powerful moments and the moments when the greatest degree of magic and serendipity happened in my life. Sometimes we need a smidgen of struggle to make us hungry. You know, when we look in the Old Testament, which is one of my favorite places to go reading, I know it's weird, but it's where I love to go read. And you look at the story of manna in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when the, when the Israelites cross the Red Sea and they're in the desert and they, they, you know, they've run basically with the, the clothes on their back and a little bit of stuff, right? They're in the desert. They're like, what are we going to do? There's no water. There's no food. And God comes down and says, look, I got you. Every day, the stuff's going to fall out of the sky. It's called manna. Collect as much as you need. Don't take more than you need because if you take more than you need, it'll, it'll rot, right? Take as much as you need. If your neighbor needs help collecting it for whatever reason, take enough for your neighbor. And on the, seventh, on the sixth day, I'm going to give you double portions so you can rest on the seventh. So like this entire giant instruction manual for faith right there, right? Now, they made it fine, 40 years. They whined a lot, but they made it, right? At the end of this journey in the desert, they're getting ready to go into the land of milk and honey. And Moses, their leader, is saying, okay, you guys, you're going to go into this land of milk and honey. Everything's going to be amazing. Time out warning, he says, right? He basically says, look, you know, it's really easy to be grateful when you have just enough. Or when you're on the edge of that just enough. The tricky part of creating happens oftentimes when things are easy. Because when things get easy, sometimes we forget to be grateful. And great gratitude, by the way, is the currency of transformation. You can't change anything you hate. So he says, you know, gratitude is the currency of transformation. You got to get grateful here. Because if you stop getting great, being grateful and you lose your hunger, and you start to get confused and delusional and think that you created everything instead of God created everything, then you're going to get a cosmic smackdown of sorts, right? I personally believe that part of why we've got some challenges going on on the planet right now, and potentially if we're not careful, if we're not deliberately steering our consciousness towards this place of sustainable peace, we have the potential for a cosmic smackdown as part of this evolution. Because if it's so easy, if we have it too easy, we forget to harness our true creative grit, our true connection to source. And I might lovingly and gently suggest to all of us that we need to explore in our lives what makes us hungry 
hungry enough to take leap of, leaps of faith. And, you know, it, when we look at the, the energy of hunger, which, by the way, is, is the energy for faith, the energy of faith and hunger are on the same place in the chart. And that the energy for sufficiency and abundance is also the energy for digestion and assimilation and absorption. So our physical body is this metaphor for spiritual hunger. And oftentimes when we eat, overeat, or we eat emotionally, or we eat sweet foods, it's because we're missing our spiritual connection and we're trying to fill it with food because it's the same energy, right? It says 3955. Hunger is vital for the creative process. We get hungry when we appreciate and we get hungry when we see what else is possible. And it's, this is just a little loving, gentle nudge for you to not forget to use gratitude and conscious creation when things get easy. And to recognize that things start to get struggle filled a little bit. That's actually the universe saying, woohoo, you forgot how creative you are. We're going to remind you. And to not go into, oh, I suck, I fail, because that's usually where we tend to go, right? That's not what it is. It's just the universe going, whoa, you're really, really creative and you forgot. So we're going to like re trigger your hunger a little bit because you need to create bigger than what you're creating right now because you deserve more, right? So this is a quotation from. John Randolph Price from the Abundance Book, which is one of my favorite little books to read. Um, and this is a 40-day prosperity plan that he has. This book's like six bucks on Amazon. Go get it. I, I love this book. It says, I keep my mind and thoughts off of this world, and I place my entire focus on God within as the cause of my prosperity. I acknowledge the inner presence as the only activity in my financial affairs, as the substance of all things visible. I place my faith in the principle of abundance in action within me. All right, stage two, you ready? In stage two, we see a shift in the way the energy flows through the channel 59.6, which is called the channel of reproduction and mating. It is a deeply tribal energy, and it is the place where the archetype of masculine energy lives. Okay, and I'm saying archetype because obviously if you are, you know, whatever gender you identify with, you can embody this energy. You might have us defined in your chart and you might be a lady who loves really super ultra feminine things. It's not about how we express physically in the world. It's about qualities of archetypes. And this is a place where in the archetype of masculine defense or masculine tribal energy, this is a place where we have the energy for sex and sexuality, for war and defending the tribe through acts of war, through you know, physically defending your tribe. It's also the place where we have hunting and going to make the kill to provide the resources for the tribe. It's kind of a primal quality of this energy. It is emotional and it's sacral. What we see when the shift of this energy changes in this stage two is that we see a death of desire specifically in relationship to reproduction and war meaning the quality and the characteristics of our sexual desires and our war desires, our violent tendencies, change. It changes, and the consciousness moves now more towards peace and acceptance, a redefinition of sexuality and sex and sexual agreements and the contracts we make around our sex and sexuality and sexual agreements how we raise and create children even. So all of this is subject to change right now. We also see in conjunction with this an end of learning from a place of contrast. This is sort of stepping up, going from binary consciousness. Now we stop learning from a place of contrast. We don't have to push up against what we hate to discover what we love. And that's changing. The nature of how we create children, the definition of family, the definition of what's allowed within the context of sexual contracts and agreements is changing. And again, if you've been taking any kind of a stock on the conversations we're having collectively, at least in the Western world, around this information, this energy, you know we're in a huge conflict around this right now. Gender identity, homosexual marriages. All of this, all of this stuff, this, this, these, what seem to be really concrete, you know, deep terms in our collective, 
and our tribes, all of these are subject to redefinition. And we are pushing towards reframing what does love mean? What do the bonds we make mean? How do we create family? How do we create resources? All of this is subject to redefinition. Now, here's the other piece that I want you to understand so that you can kind of get a bead on what's going on here. When we look at the circuitry of evolution in the human design chart, the human process of evolving, it has built into it a two steps forward, one step back quality. Meaning anytime we go through an evolution as human beings, a cultural evolution, a collective evolution, a physical evolution, we have built into it a surge forward. And I think if you really look at this concept of sex and sexuality and gender and all this, we've had a huge surge forward in the last few years. It is natural as a way of testing and proving the validity of a mutation. It is natural when we have a surge forward in evolution for us to have a step back, a conservative backlash. That doesn't mean we slide all the way back. I know that it's scary and it can feel like we are for some of us. You know, but it won't happen. It's that we have a conservative backlash. That's that one step back. We're not going two steps back. We're going one step back and then we go forward again. Evolution has this start stop process to it. And in the end, it's actually a protective thing. It keeps us from going so far into a mutation that it gets out of control and it isn't proven to be effective or adaptive for the collective. So when you see what feels like a backlash or conflict around these ideas, recognize that this is the mutation proving its worthiness or fighting for its right place in the collective. And really be mindful of this energy is undergoing a shift and a change. And that's why it feels so cataclysmic right now for many of us. In stage three, we see a shift in the change of this channel, the 4037, which is the channel of community. It's also the channel where through the agreements we make in our communities, we create sustainable resources. This is a place where we have legal agreements and bonds, including, by the way, the marriage contract, which is a legal agreement, and any other kinds of legal contracts that we make. It is the place where we make deals. I give you this, you give me that. And that's a key element of the bargains and deals or regulations that we make. And then certainly it's a key component to community. Well, what does this mean? It cements the changes in the nature of our agreements, especially our long-term bonds, and creates collective infrastructure to reflect these changes. And as an example, again, gay marriage. And it creates new frontiers in community. What is community? I think the internet is a really interesting manifestation of the change in this energy. Think about how we are doing community. Right? Um, but I don't, I don't do this for, you know, so that you guys can hear me. I do this because I love to get people together around an idea. I love the idea of creating community around ideas, right? So I think the way we do community is so interesting and evolving, right? I see people reach out to each other. I see people celebrate each other's births, marriages. I see people console each other and love on each other when they have losses. I see people document their life story, including their pregnancies, their terminal illnesses, their experiences with money. This, I'll tell you, last week on Facebook, there was a woman who is a friend of mine. I don't really know her very well, but I think she watches my show sometimes. She had a car accident her car was in the shop she didn't have the money to get the car out of the shop and she was depending on that car for work because she drives for one of the you know, rideshare companies and was like terrified because she was losing her income and couldn't get the car out so she posted a little note on facebook and she said you know i just need 88 people to help me out here giving give me 20 dollars a piece it started this massive, beautiful flood of people giving her the support she needed. And within two days, she was able to go get her car out of the body shop and began to get back on the road again, literally, to creating her income and support for her children. That's community, right? That's so amazing. I love this story so much. You have no idea. So we're changing the nature of how we do community. And we create community. We're creating community across the world with people we never even will ever probably meet physically, but yet we build these bonds. 
This also means that business is now rooted in abundance of spirit. We do business because it feels right. And with the corresponding creation of collective infrastructure, we make agreements because they are right. They're correct. They're aligned. Not only because there's an exchange of value. There can be, and there probably will be some. But it's also because it's the right thing to do. We become, we become motivated to contribute our part. We become a we versus a me. And we begin to look at the world in the context of what can I give to the world. In stage four, this is the final change and shift in the chart. We see a breaking apart, literally, of this channel. Right now, the 1949 connects us to mammalian energy. And our biophysiology and our energy field has needed up until this point to eat meat to keep us grounded in the earth story. When this bond between this channel comes apart, it delineates humanity from the animal kingdom permanently. We no longer need meat to stay in the human story, which means this trend towards plant-based diets, vegetarianism, veganism, all of this is a symptom of this 1949 energy coming apart and changing. And of course, it makes total sense. And again, it makes sense because the consciousness is creating it this way. It's not like accidentally now all of a sudden everybody on the planet is saying, ooh, plant-based diet is good for you. Ooh, plant-based diet would affect global warming. We, the world is reflecting back to us the shift in consciousness. This trend towards plant-based eating is a reflection of the evolution of our consciousness. We're not responding to it. We're creating it. So we begin to see a change in the nature of our relationships with the animal kingdom. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if you right now are like, no, I really like my bacon. I'm not giving up bacon. That doesn't mean you're not on the evolutionary chain. It just means that's not what you're creating right now. All right? You're creating other parts of it. We're all doing little parts of it. This shift does change the entire definition of Courtship and marriage, by the way, this energy is the same channel as the energy of love and marriage. And that's not where the legal contract is, it's where the courtship is. So the nature of how we court and connect with each other, think Tinder, okay? Or before that, what was it, match.com or whatever. You know, this is a very different way of doing courtship, right? This is just an example of this is changing. It also changes the way in which we eat and all the fur also furthers changes in the economy and, of course, our energy system. So here's my little inspiration for you. Doesn't this look yum? It does to me. <laughs> this could be my dinner tonight. It also shifts our focus and our resources away from defense to, sus to creating sustenance for the world. We become focused on using food as a way of creating intimacy in the world, of connecting people through each other, through community and, and you know, to each other. We also see as a part of this an end to the logical, the logical circuitry as we know it. Logical circuitry itself is changing, which means we begin to create not from a place of fear and doubt, which is the driver of logic, but from a place of possibility through the emotional solar plexus and the gate 55. So as I said, we see an end of fear-based instinct and an intuitive knowing about what's correct and aligned, driven by love and a drive towards, and we actually see this, the circuitry for the economy is changing. And what drives the new quantum economy is a drive towards creating well-being for all. We see in this change in this entire change, a shift from the consciousness of lack, I don't have, to an awareness of what's possible and a creation of abundance. We see as part of this evolution, new conscious connections, we begin to be able to choose, not just from our local family within the context of the local rules that we have or we've been limited by, we can now connect with people all over the world and redefine and deepen the meaning of the expression of the love that we feel as humans. We see as a part of this evolution an economy rooted in love and integrity and doing business that feels right and also feeds people. The measurement of the value of a business is no longer going to be how much profit does it make, but how much well-being does it generate and how many people can it help feed. 
we will see, particularly, I think, in the next few years, changes in education and in the government. Our education system has to change. It's a logically based system right now. And it is a system that I believe, healthcare system as well, it's a system I believe is doing tremendous harm to people. And when we redefine education and the role of education and how we educate people, we will reestablish a system that supports children in being raised to the fulfillment of their true and genuine potential. We're going to see an evolution of a better democracy. The definition of democracy is changing. The expression and the experience of democracy is changing. And as we go through these growing pains that we're experiencing with democracy in the Western world right now in particular, we will see, especially if you look at the chart, the highest expression, the highest potential for people to come together collectively in governmental organizations is democracy. We're going to see an improvement of the model of democracy. We're going to see an amplified creative capacity in the world. Our ability to create will go up exponentially. And I believe, this is the world according to Karen, but I believe that we are on the cusp of a powerful creative revolution. We had a scientific revolution. We've had the age of information. I believe that in the next few years, you're going to see us go into a state of amplified creative capacity, maybe because we might be a little hungry. Maybe the fear of the end of the world will inspire us enough to get more creative. I think that's probably true. We see in this mutation a promise for a better world, the beginning of an era of sustainable peace. And this is, this is the Hopi prophecy. This is a prophecy that comes from the Hopi people that says, when the earth is ravaged and the animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come unto the earth from many colors, creeds, and classes, and who by their actions and deeds shall make the earth green again. They shall be known as the warriors of the rainbow. That's you guys. You all are already doing it by virtue of your existence and by, by your willingness to engage in the learning necessary to serve the evolution of humanity the way that you are. But we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads and, you know, the evolution is going to happen no matter what. That's already in the morphogenetic field. It's already in the, the bioenergetic field. How we get there is the big thing in front of us. We're either going to get there kicking and screaming and fighting and slipping into old consciousness that's divisive and blaming. We're going to fail to harness the power of our creative source. and and resist. I said resistance already. We're going to think it's not possible for us to be creating by virtue of our faith. Or, because, and this is you guys, because you know what's happening. And it doesn't take that many people, by the way, to shift this. We're going to continue to unify in consciousness around the idea of creating a sustainable world. A sustainable world of sustainable resources with sustainable peace. To get there, we ourselves have to make ourselves sustainable and we have to consciously harness consciousness to continue to create this. Here's some things you can do <laughs> to continue with the activation of the mutation. Get back into the habit of visualizing if you've lost it every day. And part of what I want to invite you to visualize is this new world we're building. Learn to trust yourself more and follow your intuition. Do what feels right, even if it's not logical. Don't always rely on logic as the only way of knowing. And redefine the story of who you think you are. Make it true. You come from an energy that can create universes and planets and stars. In your non-incarnate form, you are a powerhouse of infinite capacity. You are manifested in this physical story, but you haven't lost your power. And don't forget that. So let's put it all together. Here's your recipe for setting higher intentions and, and creating. All right, you ready? Ask questions. Observe the world with loving curiosity and have a sense of exploration and adventure. If you want something or you want something different, ask a question and let the universe answer the question. Relax your mind and focus on opening your pineal gland. And there are lots and lots of ways to do this. Write that down. Go search it on Google. Or if you like, I can post some handouts for that. 
Use your intuitive listening and your awareness and cultivate a deep trust of your intuition. Maintain a high emotional frequency. Get into the habit and the practice and take care of yourself doing this of maintaining a high quality of emotional energy. Learn to incubate and wait with patience. Sometimes it's the impatience that burns us out. See what shows up. Be grateful. Maintain your focus. Realign. Uh, I wrote this down today relapsing meaning getting you know forgetting to stay focused and forgetting your emotional alignment doesn't mean you have to start over you just start from where you got off all right recalibrate yourself with love constantly rest recreate resource begin again take direction it's not a linear thing it might have some some hiccups in it and it's okay just get back on the horse use your mind to question not answer let the universe bring you the answers Use inspiration and imagination to stimulate your emotional vibration. Ooh, that rhymes. Emotional vibration synchronizes with the magnetic monopole in the heart, which then attracts. See what shows up in your outer world in response to your vibration. If you like it, ask for more. If you don't, ask for something different. Think sufficiency, not overabundance. Think sustainably and be resilient. Stay hopeful, awash in beauty. Nurture yourself. Stay tuned to truth. Have faith even if you don't see it. Stay grateful. I think I said that a couple of times. Focus on what is working. Watch the sunrise and set. Eat vegan or as close as you can if you feel so aligned. Go outside regularly and try to minimize your EMP or actually it's supposed to be an F, EMF exposure. Work on the subtle body and the physical level, meaning take care of yourself. Get energy work. Keep yourself aligned as much as possible. And love your body. Let go of how you think everything should look and stop trying to figure it all out. Decondition, decondition, decondition. Question everything. Distract the mind. Engage in beauty, breathing, meditation, movement. Shift your awareness. Embrace your design and your openness. Love with all of your heart. You are a quantum peace warrior. Whether you are a shaman or whether you are working on accounting in a cubicle, it's not what you do that matters, it's how you be. And most importantly, it's about you fully occupying and owning and claiming and defending your unique and powerful role in the evolution of the world. That means you stay happy. You take care of yourself. And if you start to feel guilty about being happy when it feels like the rest of the world is suffering, stop. Happiness and well-being are contagious. We need more people to be happy and in a state of well-being than we need miserable. A happy friend of a friend of a friend increases your chance of personal happiness by about 6%. This is science, you guys. A happy next door neighbor ups the odds of the person's happiness by 34%. So get happy so you can make your neighbors happy. A sibling who lives within a mile increases your odds. A happy sibling, let me just add that, who lives within a mile increases your odds of being happy by 14%. And a friend who's happy who lives within half a mile increases your chance of being happy by a whopping 42%. Each happy contact increases a person's odds of happiness by an average of 9%, while an unhappy contact decreases those odds by 7 Your happiness, your well-being, you doing you matters. And if you think it doesn't, I promise you it's influencing everybody around you. You're holding and occupying a frequency of energy, of alignment, sustainability, and joy. And a frequency of abundance and faith. Those are energy frequencies that impact the people around you, who impact the people around them, who impact the people around them, who impact the people around them. You matter. You absolutely matter in this evolution. I want to thank each and every one of you because each and every one of you is playing a vital role in this evolution. You are a vital unique and irreplaceable part of the cosmic plan and we are all who we are and we are where we are in this evolution because you are who you are we could not do it without you we don't want to do it without you so i thank you for showing up and being here on the planet at this really important time uh thank you all for all the loving community we've created Thank you all for your listenership, your watch, your watcher, your viewership, and for everything that you bring to our beautiful community. So be well, take care. 